but we're going to talk about judgment. <laughs> and uh, I just haven't been on to always look at the calendar and decide what the message ought to be that day because of the whatever time it is. But uh, we're, we've been looking and studying. We're actually studying the book of Philippians. You wouldn't know it from the last couple weeks and you won't know it for a couple more weeks after this because there's a verse in Philippians that made us stop and really, at least made me stop and look at the judgment seat of Christ a little bit closer. And uh, not that we're really trying to study everything about the judgment seat of Christ. We just need to be aware of it and, uh, and, and look at the verses. The judgment seat of Christ is a place in which the believers uh, in heaven when they stand before Jesus Christ and we bow in heaven and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, there'll be a time that we'll give an account of ourselves to him, of our service to him. And uh, that came out of Philippians chapter 2 and verse 16. Let me read the scriptures that we've looked at closely for the last couple weeks and we'll just we'll get, go beyond it this week. There's, uh, when we read verse 15, catch that statement, yet so is by fire. Verse 10 of 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says, According to the grace of which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. Because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. And know, know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him will God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. I'll just stop right there just without admonition. Let's pray. Our Father, we do pray as we uh, reflect upon the time that's yet to come for us as believers, that, uh, that we might... Take this as warning and as teaching, as exhortation uh, for our lives, and we might be uh, prepared to stand before you someday. Um, Father, we also pray that if there's someone among us that doesn't know Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sins, uh, we pray that they uh, would understand today how to be saved so that the only thing they'll give account of is their service, and they certainly will not stand before we pray they will not stand before uh, your son as a sinner. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Philippians 2 verse 16 is where the Apostle Paul said, uh, holding forth the word of life, and it was an admonition to the Philippian saints. In fact, one of, one of the things I want you to keep in mind, when, you study, when we're studying the book of Philippians, the Philippians were a testimony church. Those people were living for the gospel. They were striving together for the faith of the gospel. And so when Paul's encouraging them and he says, holding forth the word of faith that I might rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not labored in vain, neither lab uh, uh, that I had not run in vain, neither labored in vain, uh, that Paul's expectation is that when he stands before the judgment seat of Christ, and that's what he's referring to, uh, that in the day of Christ, the day of Christ is, starts out with, it's the end of the age of grace, it's the end of our life and service here on earth because it culminates, our service culminates in the rapture. We get caught up into heaven and then in the heavens we'll stand before Jesus Christ and give an account of ourselves. So when he, Paul talks about the day of Christ, he's talking about rejoicing in the day of Christ because his labor, his running and his labor among the Philippian saints uh, that they're found holding forth the word of life, living for the Lord until the Lord takes them away, that he's going to rejoice in that day. Because his labor wasn't in vain, uh, and his running wasn't in vain. So he speaks in a real positive way. But that caused us to stop and think a little bit about that, that day, uh, the day of Christ. And, and we went back to Romans chapter 13 and realized it said there that that day was at hand and warned us not to sleep. Romans chapter 14 told us that that day is when we're going to stand, it actually used the phrase, stand at the judgment seat of Christ. And that's when every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. 
And what we're going to give an account of is our service uh, to the Lord. Once He saved us and we, He become our Lord, our life is supposed to be a life of service for Him. And because we're going to meet the Lord, we're going to give an account of our service to Him. So we've learned that. We, we, we went on to, to learn that uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 3 here, that our works are kind of evaluated into two different categories. Uh, as we stand before the Lord, there, the, the works are going to be tried. As verse 13 says, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. And fire is going to be put to it, and, and the works are described in verse 12 as gold, silver, precious stone, or wood, hay, and stubble. And all you got to do is put a little fire to, to each one of those elements and which ones will abide. If any man's work abide, verse 14 says, he shall, uh, that he's built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Verse 15, but if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. And, and we're, that's really the theme verse that we're looking at today. But we've already learned about that trial that's going to try. And, and wood, hay, and stubble will certainly burn to, be burned away. But that gold, silver, and precious stone are works that would seem to be works that are gold representing God's place in our life, silver where the emphasis of the gospel in our life, living for and, and communicating that gospel message, precious stone, the inner beauty of God's Holy Spirit as it says there in verse 16, know ye not that ye are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. God wants to manifest His life in, in your life. And as that happens, those things are considered precious stones. And so those things will be rewarded. And the things that are burned, the gold, or the wood, hay, and stubble, well, those are all the things that would fall into the category of religious works, of human wisdom. And, and by the way, the problem at Corinth is not just their carnal lifestyle, but they're always seeking man's wisdom. Uh, especially when you realize how close they are to Athens, Greece, and how they thought they were the center of knowledge and all of that. But man's wisdom gets burned away. All the religious efforts of man get burned away. Uh, Self-determination, all that gets burned away. Anything done in the flesh, that certainly gets burned away. And, uh, and, and so as we looked at these verses, we begin to realize what really counts with God. I don't know if I've communicated to you as, as clearly as I come to understand by looking closely, especially at Philippians chapter 2, because that's, that whole chapter, if you'll remember it, is an admonition for our life. And Romans chapter 14, because that's all about our service for God and us giving account of that service, that when you look real close at those passages, it becomes real clear that what God is concerned about at the judgment seat of Christ is, is our service toward people in people's lives, getting out the gospel to the lost and edifying the saints. And, and the context is real clear in both of those. That's why holding forth the word of life. We live in a dark world, as Philippians has taught us. And as believers, we hold forth that word of life so people can see the gospel of Christ and be saved. And uh, those are the things that are going to count with God. And, and it, it's, it's real important in two ways. In, in fact, if you're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ, you want to know what God's concern is at the judgment seat of Christ. So, so it's important that way. The other is to narrow it down to, and, and that's not all we give an account for, but it is a, a priority that we give an account for. It, to take all the things of the expectations and be able to get it, you know, get a hand on it. To think, and it really matches what you learn in First Timothy, where it's God's will for all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Your life of service is a life of ministry to people, to help them get saved, to help them to be edified, and all the words, all the admonition in Corinthians, not to offend your brother. We kept looking at verses like that, so that ministry is the ministry in the lives of other people, so that the lost could be saved, the saints could be edified, and you don't want to be a stumbling block to your brother. You keep those three things in mind, you're living a life of service for the Lord that will mount to gold, silver, and precious stone. But we want to deal with something that's also here, and that is at verse 15. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. I told Roy to put the title of the message today, Saved, Yet So As By Fire. Because the question at this judgment seat of Christ. And remember, it's our works. We're not saved by our works. This is our service. At the judgment seat of Christ, that, that when the fire tries, and what if everything is burned away? 
What, you, naturally, anything that's wood, hay, and stubble is going to be burned away, but what if all your life service is called wood, hay, and stubble and it's burned away? What if, what if you lose it all? What if it's all burned? Well, the verse says, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. He, he'd be saved by that fire. Gary Duty, uh, I told him I was going to quote him on this, he, he has a song, in fact, it's one of his, his CDs, are actually entitled, Whatever Abides the Fire. But in the song, he sings, uh, When I stand before you, singing to the Lord, When I stand before you and my life's work is tried, There you, you'll view the contents with the finest jeweler's eye. Let whatever survives the fire be made into a crown, and then I'll bow before you and gladly lay it down. Amen. And, uh, you know, uh, we'll, we'll, we are going to talk about the verses, how our rewards are sometimes called crowns, and you'll even see in today how that rewards are going to be given to us in a, a place of reigning with Christ in eternity. Where is our place in eternity? It's going to be based on our service here and the rewards that we receive for our service. And then there is that place in Revelation where the, the 24 elders lay down their crown before Jesus Christ. But in all of talking about precious stones, and I'm thinking of a, a, a passage in Chronicles where David conquers a king and he takes off the king's crown. And the king's crown is a talent of gold, so that's like a pound of gold, his crown, with all kinds of precious stones in the crown. And, uh, and to realize that uh, our works are going to be, the good works will be manif that will be rewarded are gold, silver, and precious stones, and they're sometimes called crown. Uh, interesting analogy there that, the, that crown the jewels that are left to be made into a crown and lay it down at the feet of Jesus Christ, because he's the one who's worthy, and it's, it's what he does in our life that is rewarded uh, at the judgment seat of Christ. But my point is not so much... The positive there is I want to think a little bit about that phrase there, yet so is by fire, and, and what if there's nothing that abides the fire? Well, if nothing abides the fire, there's still the grace of God that stands there. Amen. Because the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Interestingly, that, that verse 8 of Ephesians, I don't want to go there because we've got a lot of other verses to look at, but it's, it's preceded by verse 6 that talks about, uh, about, and 7, about us being seated with Christ in heavenly places that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his kindness and his grace toward us. See, what God wants to put on display in your life and in the ages to come is his grace. And whatever abides the fire, if none of your service abides the fire, you still stand there in the grace of God, and that's what God's going to be, be, set you up as a trophy of His grace in the heavens. That stands. And you still stand there perfect in God's Son. You stand there in Christ. So, so you're secure, are you not? Even, even if your service, none of it abides the fire. Now hopefully... There will always be something that's going to not abide the fire and burn away. Hopefully there's gold, silver, and precious stone, but you kind of worry about what about a life where there's nothing left that abides the fire? Well, there's still the grace of God and there's still Jesus Christ. And by the time we're done, there's still the glory and praise of God that you're going to see. But, but I want to think about that. And in thinking about that, come back with me to Romans. That's the book before Corinthians, chapter 5. Jim had you quote the right verse. I guess here's where we'll talk about love. When the Apostle Paul taught the gospel, he, was, he already brought up the accusation that was made in chapter 3, but it, it, it's uh, apply, implied again here in Romans chapter 5. The Apostle Paul, summing up the, the gospel of salvation, how we're justified freely by God's grace because of the payment that Jesus Christ made on the cross. Jesus Christ died for our sins, completely took care of the sin payment, satisfied the, the justice of God against us for our sins. Paid for it so that there's nothing else for us to do. We can't add anything to that. What God is expecting us to do is to believe what His Son did. Amen. To receive His love, to receive His grace, to trust in the blood of Jesus Christ as the payment of sin. And the moment you do that, God declares you righteous because Christ took care of your sins and when you trust Jesus Christ, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, not your righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ is put to your account and God declares you righteous. So that in these verses, it says in verse 6 of Romans 5, for when we were yet without strength, we don't have, we don't have the, the means in our flesh to live a perfect life acceptable to God. 
We're without the ability to do it. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Now, you know, that tells you that before you can be saved, you've got to acknowledge you're ungodly. Anybody who thinks they're not ungodly can never be saved because they think they're good enough before God. They need to uh, acknowledge that verse that they're without strength, but that Christ died for the ungodly. And he explains, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God, he didn't, Jesus Christ didn't die for a righteous man, he didn't die for a good man, because there is none righteous and there's no none good. <laughs> no none good, there's none good, <laughs> Romans chapter 3 says. But, so that's why verse 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Don't have to worry about standing before God and your sins standing there and you suffering the penalty of your sins because Christ paid for it all. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life. So when Paul taught in the book of Romans about salvation by grace through faith alone apart from works, especially, look at the conclusion of chapter 5, look at verse 20. He says, Moreover the law entered that the offense might abound. The law makes you look even worse than you thought you were, because you are worse than you thought you were. <laughs> Moreover the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. That's why I said if all, if all your works get burned away, you still stand there in God's grace, in God's Son, righteous, saved, secure. So when Paul taught salvation this way, it caused people to respond a certain way that if you share the gospel of grace to someone clearly, they'll say the exact same thing to you. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace should abound? Oh yeah, I'm not saved by my works. I'm saved just by believing what Jesus Christ did and He paid for all my sins. Then that means I just trust Jesus Christ as my Savior and I can go out and live in sin. You can. Should you? Is that why God saved you? He wanted to give you a, 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 pass, a free pass to sinning? No, the verse 2 says, God forbid. And he even starts acknowledging, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not. There's some things that people don't know when they think they, should, they can go out and live in sin again. But, but the point is, is when you preach, especially verse, chapter 5, verse 20, moreover the law entered where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. You can't out-sin God's grace. Well, people always want to respond that way. Well, then I'll just go out and live in sin. Well, the question that people ask, does that mean I can just go and live any way I please, or that means I can just go and, and live in sin? They actually need to ask the question with the full implication. Say, that, does, that, does grace mean I can live any way I please? That's what they're saying. But they're implying one more part to that, and if you just finish the question properly, the answer is self-explainable. Explainable. <laughs> The answer is there. The, to finish the question, does grace mean I can live any way I please without any consequence? Well, I finished the statement there, you know. What, what, are you, what are you asking? Is there no consequence? Well, there's no consequence of damnation because Jesus Christ paid for your sins. But is there a consequence for sin? If you haven't wrote, don't know this verse, my dad trained our family on this verse as kids. Every time we did wrong, he pounded this verse into our heads. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. It says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to his flesh so shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to the Spirit shall reap uh, uh, life everlasting. The... the there, the principle of sowing and reaping, Paul says, is don't be mocked. God's not mocked. That what you sow, is there a consequence for living in sin? Absolutely. Sin destroys. Sin is a ruination. It's destruction. It's always related to death. And sin does ruin, destroy, and bring death, physical and, and, and spiritual in the sense of non-production for the Lord. 
So is there a consequence for sin? Sure there is. In this world, there's a consequence. You do wrong, there, there's consequences for it. So don't be mocked, or don't try to mock God uh, and think you can. So there is consequences, but that's one consequence. There's a second consequence when you read the book of Galatians chapter 5. It lists the fruit, uh, uh, well, it first lists the works of the flesh and shows how all the works of the flesh are destructive. Then it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, temperance, meekness. Against such there is no law. Do you realize that if you live any way you please and you choose to live in the flesh, that you'll forfeit the fruit of God in your life? Amen. You'll forfeit love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness. All that's forfeited. So what do you experience? Well, you experience an emotional wreck that people run to a psychiatrist try to get an answer for. When the problem is, is live the way God said to live in the first place, and the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. You don't have to see a psychiatrist for those things, do you? And against such there is no law. You, you'll be living right even the, in the sight of man, let alone seeing the fruit of God in your life. So... So there is that consequence, forfeiting the fruit of the Spirit. But there's the third consequence, and that's what we're studying, that 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 15. That you're, if you live a life in the flesh, living the way that you want to live it, any way you please, and you choose to, to live a life uh, in the flesh, it's going to be certainly wood, hay, and stubble. The fire at the judgment seat of Christ is going to try that and it's going to burn the wood, hay, and stubble away and it's all going to be gone. The, the, the third consequence of your sin is, it says there, he shall suffer loss. Suffer loss. That's a negative term, is it not? To suffer loss there is, is not the loss of the soul. We already saw, yet he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. All those works are gone. They don't stand before God. So he, he saves, so it's not a loss of a soul, and it's not the loss of a physical life, and, and it's not even the loss at the judgment seat of Christ, because I keep thinking about our emotions at the judgment seat of Christ, but he shall suffer loss. It's not suffering emotionally at the judgment seat of Christ either. What do you lose the loss of? What he loses the loss of everything that, that was evaluated as wood, hay, and stubble. He's lost the, the, the all that he valued in life, that he lived life for, found out it's gone. Everything he accomplished, everything he purposed, everything that they did, that's, that wood, hay, and stubble, the judgment seat of Christ, the fire tries it, and it's gone. The man suffers loss. Everything he lived for is gone. That's a suffering of loss. There's nothing of any eternal value. Nothing to give an account for before God that not only is eternal value, but in an acknowledgement of the life and the time God gave you here on earth. Nothing left. Your life was a wasted time. Nothing left means no gold, no silver, no precious stone, no reward. You suffer loss. Loss of a life that could have been used for God's glory here. A loss of any value that you thought of life to be. A loss of an opportunity to be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. When it says you shall suffer loss, now, <laughs> that's why I think, wow, emotions have certainly been presented to me that I'll already be in a resurrected body, so thank the Lord. But you think about that now. <laughs> now the emotion can hit you now, can it? And it would be a good idea to hit you right now to think about that. But, it says, he shall suffer loss. Let me read the verse. I keep flipping back over there. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But, so suffering loss is the negative, but the positive is this. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. He himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. He has eternal life. But also saved in this sense, there's nothing left there to condemn him. All the things that he was self-effort, religious effort, self-determination, human knowledge, whatever he lived his life for, even if it was the, the satisfaction of flesh, there's nothing there. He's saved. <laughs> he, wouldn't you be glad it's not standing there between you and God? 
It's gone. He himself shall be saved. There's nothing there to condemn him. There's nothing there that's unacceptable to God. The only thing that's going to be there is gold, silver, precious stone, or a saved man by the grace of God standing in Christ. Amen. Nothing there unacceptable to God. There, there's nothing there that stands uh, between him and God, just a person saved by grace, as the Bible says, accepted in the beloved. God looking at a child of his own, a child standing in his son, that his son is accepted in the beloved. You're accepted with the Lord because you're accepted in Christ. Now, with that, so you understand there's consequences at the judgment seat of Christ. It's interesting to me that, that the, the, book, the, the most references to that day, as it says in verse 13, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day, there's more references to the judgment seat of Christ and what it's going to be like to stand at the judgment seat of Christ found in Corinthians than any other Paul's epistles. I find that interesting, especially in light of chapter 3 and verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither are ye able now, for, for ye are yet carnal. And he explains how he knows they're carnal. Carnal Christian, living for the flesh. Fleshly Christians, living out of the impulses of the flesh, living out of the desires of their own heart, living out of the uh, 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 humanism and philosophy of men. Paul calls them carnal. And then all the way through Corinthians, there's this, these warnings about the judgment seat of Christ so that when you read 1 Corinthians 13, it's a warning now that someday we're going to give an account. We already, we already read from Romans chapter 14, every man shall give an account of himself to God. And now we get a little bit idea of how God's going to evaluate us at the judgment seat of Christ and, and how we'll be saved yet so as by fire, but yet we have the opportunity of standing there and having gold, silver, and precious stones and even what God would consider that to be as you look at the passage. Now, I want to move beyond that. We get that warning. Paul's not really done with the statement. In chapter 4, verse 1, let me read you 1 through 5, and notice he still has the judgment seat of Christ in mind. He says, Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you, or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self. For I know nothing by myself, and yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. You know, if I read verse 4, realizing that Paul's talking about the, the judgment of the Corinthians and man's judgment, and, and then realize that there's going to come a time in which God is going to judge, and when he judges, Jesus Christ is going to come and judge the hidden things of darkness and make manifest the counsel of the heart. I would almost look at verse 5 if it's sat by itself and think, oh, that's when he comes and judges lost people. The hidden darkness of the heart. Make manifest the counsels of the heart. But, but, at, but when you look at Paul saying that, that, he, that, that it's a, no big thing for the Corinthians to judge him or be judged by man, and he doesn't judge himself, he says, uh, he that judges is the Lord. And Paul's talking about himself being judged of Jesus Christ. The point is, is the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he judges me. He is our judge. We're going to give an account of ourselves to him. And, and, and so we need to take heed of that and a sense in which it's how I evaluate you means nothing. How you evaluate yourself really means nothing. How others think of you means nothing. You're going to be judged of Jesus Christ. He's going to be your judge. And that's a fact. So with that in mind, let's look at this passage and learn a little bit more about that. It starts out in verse 1 saying, Let no man... Let no man let, no, no. Let a man account of us as ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Hopefully you were 
here or you can get the messages from the prior studies how important it was at the judgment seat of Christ that we build upon the foundation of Jesus Christ according to the master plan that was given to the Apostle Paul about the age of grace. Realizing what God is doing in us today is revealed in Paul's epistles for what God's purpose is in the body of Christ. You fulfill what was written in the Old Testament to the nation of Israel, that's wood, hay, and stubble. Amen. That's not Amen. what God gave you. That's why Paul's emphasizing here, let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of, uh, of God. Paul, Paul's message was a secret um, that was uh, kept... A, mess, a, a secret, a mystery that was kept secret since the world began. Amen. What God wants done in the age of grace. When he talks about himself as stewards, he's actually referring, uh, uh, one of the definitions of the word dispensation is stewardship. Yeah. And, and you get the important part of that. Not only do you account Paul as a steward of the mysteries of Christ, but verse 2 says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. If Paul's thinking about himself being judged by Jesus Christ, his concern is not what the Corinthians think about him. <laughs> he, he don't even know how to think about himself when you look at the passage. His concern is how does the Lord look at him. And he knows that what the Lord's going to look at at him is his faithfulness. Faithfulness as a steward. Now, a stu look, look at, uh, it's Luke chapter, was it 10? I've got to find my place in my notes. It's 12, Luke chapter 12. Here's, you get the definition of a steward, and remember, a steward is, it, it's, 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 it's a part of a definition of, when we say a dispensation is a, an administration, a stewardship, an economy. That's how, those are synonyms for the word dispensation. In, in Luke chapter 12, you, you get an understanding of what Paul means and what, what a dispensation is and what it is that you're going to be that God looks for as far as faithfulness is concerned. Now, what's really interesting, and I think we could do this, although we're not going to, is you could actually study the nation of Israel and God's dealings with Israel because in the second coming of Jesus Christ, just like we get raptured out and we'll give an account of ourselves, so it is when Jesus Christ comes back, unbelieving Israel is is burned, it's cast into the lake of fire, is is separated out through the tribulation, they're not going to be there to go into the kingdom. The believing remnant of Israel will be there to go into the kingdom, but before they go into their place in the kingdom, they stand before Jesus Christ, and they go through a judgment for a place of service in the kingdom. And that's what this passage is about. So, since God has, we have a different purpose that we're fulfilling today, and we've got to learn from Paul what it is God wants us to do, as Israel will learn from their apostles and prophets what God wants them to do, so it is that they're going to be evaluated for a service and a reward in, in eternity, eternity future. So by parallel, you could probably learn a lot about the judgment seat of Christ just by comparing, just make the doctrine different, but looking at what God's looking at. Anyhow, we're, we're going to make this one point. The Lord is talking about His coming back, and He says in Luke chapter 12, verse 42, it says, And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward? Well, that's what we want. We want to know, what is a faithful and wise steward? Because Paul says, Account us us as the stewards of the mysteries of Christ, not the prophetic message, but of the mysteries of Christ, and moreover it's required among stewards that a man be found faithful. So then, who then is that faithful and wise steward? whom the Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Now, so doing in the context is watching for the Lord to come and busy doing what the Lord would want done before he comes back. That'll be a faithful servant, someone who's doing what the Lord wants done. But, you know, when he talks about that, a steward... There, you get the idea that, that the reward, he shall make ruler over his household. When we say that if any man's work abide, he shall receive a reward, the reward that we're going to receive is a place of rulership, a place of authority in eternity future. Amen. Based on God evaluating our faithful service to the service that we're supposed to be conducting now, we get placed in a place of rulership. And to give them their, their portion of meat in due season. That's what a steward was assigned to do. A steward is a man who, a rich man would have a steward. 
And because he's rich, he can't keep track of all his money and all the things he's accomplishing, all the servants, the running of the household, and so forth. So he has a steward. Abraham had a steward. And that steward actually went out and found a wife for his son. It's a man that you entrust with helping you with your affairs. And that man's job is to give the portion of meat to the right people in due season at the right time. Now Paul says that he's a steward of the mysteries of Christ. The meat for us is the revelation of the mystery. The preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery at the right time during this age of grace. You do that and you're a faithful steward of the mysteries of Christ. That's what Paul said he was, and, and that's what you see a steward is, and, and what he would require. Look at a steward, and not only give the future responsibility of stewardship, but the responsibility that we now have as stewards of Christ. So that what God, to do what God wants done now, in this age of grace. And that, that would be a faithful steward. Well, so you get the idea of stewardship, you get the idea of reward. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So, faithfulness to what God would have done is what's going to be evaluated. That Paul was concerned that when he stands before the Lord that he would be recognized as that faithful steward. See, Paul warned the elders at Ephesus... Um, let, let me read the passage to you. Hold your place there. And, and I'm going to read Acts chapter 20. When Paul called the Ephesian elders together, he says to them, now I'm going to read a portion here, listen to this. Th these are men who were put in charge of giving the saints at Ephesus their portion of meat in due season. He says, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. So Paul says, look, elders, I've taught you everything God had for me to give you. Then he says, take heed therefore unto yourselves, and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost had made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. So they have a job to look over the, the, the body of Christ, that local ministry. But not only that, the next verse, Dave Kasner, one of your elders, this, this verse brings chills up and down his spine. He's not here so I can say that. He constantly quotes this verse because the next thing, not only will wolves come in among you, it, it, says, it says, also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. That's a real warning to the elders. It's required that a man be found faithful Amen. to God's word for God's people, ministering to God's people. And be careful that you're not the one destroying the flock, that you're not the wolf among the, uh, among the sheep there, as the illustration is, who, all, who, who uh, also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among them that are sanctified. So, Paul, when he's done giving them the whole counsel of God, he commends the, the brethren to God and the word of his grace. Because it's the word of God's grace, faithfully delivered, that can build the saints up and give them an inheritance among them that are sanctified. Amen. Now, I keep thinking about that phrase, give an inheritance. I'll show you what I mean by that. This one I want you to turn to. Look at Ephesians chapter... Well, let's go to chapter 5 first. Ephesians chapter 5. And this is where Paul talks about things that we should not involve ourselves in. People who are lost live the, this way. And, and, he, and he lists out 
Well, uh, I'll just start with a chapter so you get the context. I don't want to just break into it. <coughs> chapter 5, verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Walk in love as Christ also loved us and hath given us an offering, a sacrifice to God, a sweet-smelling savor, for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetous, let it not be named among you as become a saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish jesting, uh, foolish talking or, nor jesting, which is not convenient, but rather the giving of thanks. For this we ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of, of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you by any means, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Pastor Watkins, I used to make a statement at, this, at reading these verses. You started out, be followers of God as dear children. That is, a child that cares about what the heart of their father wants. God doesn't want us living that way. But down in verse, the wrath of God is going to come upon the children of disobedience. Pastor Watkins used to say, you know, sometimes I'm a disobedient child, but I'm not a child of disobedience. You know the difference between that? Because that's exact. look at the next verse. It's, uh, verse 7 says, Be ye not therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light, and the Lord walk as children of light. See, when it says that those unclean people, th those people are walking, they're children of disobedience. They belong to the world. They belong to the devil. They're not saved. We're, we are saved, and we're children of light, so we ought to walk as dear children. Amen. And we shouldn't be disobedient children, but we're never, once we're saved, we're never children of disobedience. The reason I say that to you is that warning there in verse 5. At the end it says, it names all those list of people, it says, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of God. Lost people have no inheritance in the kingdom of God, right? Amen. Now look at chapter 1 of Ephesians, and it's listing the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. And among them, verse 11 says, in whom we also have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him that worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Every believer has an inheritance in the kingdom of God. But I kept reading that phrase, an inheritance. We don't all have the same inheritance. In this regard, look now the next, I've got to go a couple books, to the book of Colossians chapter 3. We've looked at it before. Colossians chapter 3. All believers have an inheritance. Not unbelievers, they have no inheritance. They're going to suffer the wrath of God. <laughs> They're not saved yet so as by fire. <laughs> They're going to suffer the wrath of God. But God's grace is able to build us up and give us an inheritance. As a saint is built up by the grace of God, it determines the inheritance you're going to receive. You'll receive an inheritance, you, you inherit eternal life. But where in eternity do you have a place? Well, Colossians chapter 3, talking about us, our serving, us serving the Lord, says, uh, verse 23, and whatsoever, yeah, and whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Now, not, that's not just inheriting, is it? There's an inheritance every one of us are going to receive. There's a reward of the inheritance based on faithful service. If our work abide, we will receive a reward. There's a reward of the inheritance. And where the place is that you will reign in eternity future is based on faithful service. Now I'm out of time, but I've got more things to say from 1 Corinthians chapter 4. But I need to point you, go back to 1 Corinthians 4. We're going to jump some verses so I can show you something here that matches what we've been talking about from the very beginning. We'll, we'll look a little bit closer about Paul's, well, how he doesn't value the judgment of the Corinthians, how he doesn't judge himself. And then he says in verse 5, Therefore, 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5, Therefore judge nothing before the time. What time? Until the Lord come. We're gonna, he's going to come, we're going to meet him in the air, and then takes the judgment seat of Christ. So, 
Paul he, he's not trying to figure out how he's going to stand there. He, the Lord's the judge. He's not the judge. The Corinthians not the judge. The Lord's the judge. And when he talks about the Lord judging, boy, he kind of gets a little explicit here, doesn't he? Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and make manifest the counsels of the hearts. But notice the conclusion. Then shall every man have praise of God. Well, you know, if there's hidden things of darkness that's going to be brought to light, and the counsel of your heart, your agenda, what, what you thought you were accomplishing, that's going to be brought all out. And your motive for doing the things that you did is going to be brought out. Not just your works, <laughs> but God's going to look right down in the heart. Your agenda, what, what, why, why you were doing the things you were doing. What was the motive behind it all? But when it's all done, that phrase, then shall every man have praise of God. Why, some of those things are going to be wood, hay, and stubble, aren't they? And they're going to be burned away. And when they're burned away, do you realize every one of us at the judgment seat of Christ, how it ends? We have praise of God. That reminds me, and I told you we're studying the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 1, we've already studied this. It says, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. What's left at the judgment seat of Christ is all the work that God has produced in you. The, 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 the Christ nature that he fulfilled in you the fruit of the Spirit that became manifest in your life. When it's all done, all those other things are burned away, and what's left is you standing before God. Then shall every man have praise of God. You stand there, accepted in Jesus Christ, being praised of God because of the glory of Jesus Christ in your life. So, even when it gets a little scary, that first part of verse 5, I want you to see how it ends. So at the judgment seat of Christ we have praise of God and then we go out and serve God for all eternity for the purpose that he called us for. It starts out you being saved. Believing in the grace of God, the cross work of Christ, trusting the payment Christ made for you at the cross, God saves you by his grace to make you a trophy of his grace to serve him for eternity. And he took care of the sin problem, you just trust him for that. Trust in the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ and God will save you from your sins. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for allowing us to know and be able to, while we live life, understand the very purpose in life. Father, we pray that your word will not only guide us, but will become deep in our heart where it becomes the very purpose of life and the very motivation for what we do and why we do what we do. So that there'll be that gold, silver, and precious stone, but Father, we thank you that ultimately, because of your Son, we'll all have praise of you because we're accepted in him. Thank you for that grace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.